Hello, I'm Janice Elling, CEO of the Elling Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search by our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for joining me today for another webinar in our series where we invite thought leaders and subject matter experts to offer their advice in helping us through these turbulent times, which we hope will come to an end very soon. We hope you're all safe and well. I'm delighted today to welcome three outstanding and highly experienced business leaders and board directors who will talk about the critical impact of diversity, including gender diversity, in the boardroom to enhance culture, communications, and commitment. I'd like to first introduce Betsy Atkins, who is CEO of Baja Corporation and board director of Wynn Las Vegas, Volvo Car Group, SL Green Realty Corp, and Jamf. Next, Dawn Zier, former president and CEO of Nutrisystem and board director of Spirit Airlines, the Haynes Celestial Group, Purple Innovation, and Prestige Consumer Healthcare. And Andrea Weiss, co-founder of the O Alliance and CEO of Retail Consulting and board director of Bed Bath & Beyond, Cracker Barrel Old Country Store, O'Reilly Automotive, and RPT Realty. So welcome, ladies. It's wonderful to have such an esteemed group here with me. You're all experienced CEOs and business leaders and directors of boards. It'll be a dynamic discussion, and I welcome questions from our audience. So we all have takeaways that we can take to our boardrooms. So I wanted to start with the business case it has been made by multiple studies that there's a strong correlation between more women in the boardroom and the C-suite and stronger financial performance. Dawn, let me start with you. In your experience, what is the dynamic that women bring to the boardroom? How are the conversations changing? And beyond the financial impact, what's happening with that gender parity increasing in the boardroom? I believe that women in the boardroom drive more robust 360 conversations, not just about what the numbers are that have traditionally driven a lot of the board conversation, but the whys and hows behind them. I definitely have noticed with boards that have strong female, female leadership, the talent conversation is more front and center, corporate re responsibility is more front and center, the consumer voice is more front and center, and ESG is also more front and center. And I think this aligns well with the hot topics that are important to large institutional investors. I've also found that having two women in the boardroom is exponentially better than having one. I think it sends an important message to both management and staff, and it's easier to promote change when there's more than one voice pushing the agenda forward. With that being said, I also think it's critically important, and I am finding this to be true, that we have male allies in the boardroom and truly believe that this diversity, that believe that diversity is important. And that's encouraging because we as women, I don't believe that we can achieve parity on our own. So that's an important component. And so when you have more than three, Dawn, because the lone voice in the room, has it sometimes gotten overlooked when there's only one? And I'm sure you've been on a board where there is only one or others may comment on that as well. I think it's much easier when there's two, but uh, certainly with strong women, one strong female voice is certainly better than none, but I find two to be better. Um, I don't know, Betsy, Andrea, what have you found? Andrea, what, yeah, what's your experience with more than one woman? Yes, I'm, I'm very much in the same camp with Dawn. I think having multiple women in the boardroom um, allows for you know, a much more robust conversation and it prevents tokenization of a female uh, member of the board. And so I'm, I'm, I very much support what you just said. Thank you. And before I turn to Betsy, Betsy, you have a very uh, symbolic photo behind you. Could you comment on the inspiration behind that photo? Well, uh, it's my most valued possession. It's a portrait that I had done years ago for my mom's birthday of my mother and I. And so uh, it shows the, I hope, the close emotional connection and the fact that I get to work every day with my angel on my shoulder, my mother right above me here. Yeah. So. Uh, it's one of my story. So that's a portrait. Mm -hmm. It is. It's wonderful. And so you've been in many boardrooms, Betsy. Tell us what your experience is, is about there. And in terms of uh, 
a question of diversity and how we approach and think about diversity. So to me, I, I think that often we're now um, micro categorizing diversity, uh, female, ethnic background. And I know that Janice, you get challenged with the search of finding the unicorn uh, of you know somebody from a, a different part of the, the world, a uh, different ethnic background, a different gender, a very unique and hard to find skill set. But the purpose of diversity to me is that we all think about the opportunities differently and we can contribute and see things from a different lens and also uh, that we'll see the risks. So to me, diversity of thought is what we're looking for. And I think when you get a diverse boardroom, you certainly want gender diversity. And we're all very uh, prioritized on ethnic diversity now. But beyond that, I feel like we want international or global diversity because half of our businesses uh, have customers that we sell to, you know, outside the U.S. It's typically, you know, about 50% of a corporation's business is the U.S., 50% outside. And I think we want generational diversity. You know, Gen Zero and Millennial is now half the workforce, half the customers, half the investors that we're targeting. And, and I think we want economic diversity because, you know, if we're all the same, we don't understand the part of the market that is economically different than us. And I think even overlooked and more important is going to be technology savviness and diversity. There's not a product or a service that's not gonna be tech enabled. And you're simply not gonna be a, a vibrant competitive company if you don't have good knowledge of how you're gonna to apply tech to take friction out or drive insights more quickly. So to me, it's diversity of thought and we should look at many elements of diversity of thought to come up with the best ideas. Let's stay with that for a moment because we are finding in our searches, whether it be the C-suite or the boardroom, we're asked to represent basically visionary CEOs see this, the employees, the customers, the communities, and the shareholders or investors that they serve. So all of that diversity, Betsy, that you were just speaking about is absolutely vital. Global perspective, age perspective, and then functional areas like technology, all really important. But when you look at the US boardrooms today, still compared to overseas, we rank number 18 globally in terms of the gender factor. So we should be number one, but you know, there are countries like Malaysia, Italy, Spain, South Africa ahead of us. So how are the conversations, are you seeing them change? I'm gonna stay with Betsy for a moment in terms of gender, but now also as you were raising color, is that having an impact on the gender factor where we're already still behind where boards may be saying, we want people of color. Even before women, we want people of color. Is that one of the conversations that you're hearing more of today? Yes, you're right. Uh, coming off of uh, the tumultuous past year, we are seeing a push uh, to add racial diversity and people of color. So certainly we are seeing that, uh, although uh, I'm not generally a fan of you know, having uh, prescriptive requirements like the state of California, which has a prescriptive requirement. Uh, you know, it did work in Europe, so you're right. It's hard to refute the fact that they got to 40% in the Scandinavian countries and Italy by mandating it. Um, I, I think the talent pool coming up the C-suite is more robust in our country. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I, I imagine, Janice, maybe you're even better informed than all of us to answer that uh, the searches that you're receiving, I would imagine uh, are uh, overwhelmingly uh, focused on female directors and this year, especially on, on uh, people of color. We are seeing more of a need for people of color, but we're very clear with our clients to say, if that person wasn't a person of color, would you take them? So we really wanna make sure that we get the right you know, backgrounds and experiences and skills. And I think, again, informed and visionary boards get it, but there's a pool of candidates out there, women and people of color to go to. So that we're finding we can fill those, those seats uh, looking at both. 
Andrew, what's your experience within the boardroom in terms of the cultural, ethnicity, those differences? Well, I'm probably the only one on this call that's actually chaired a board in Europe uh, because I did chair a company there and in Spain. And you know what I would just say about the European mandates is that um, you did have some sacrifice of quality. You also had a lot of family dynamics in publicly traded companies in Europe, which were where daughters and wives of other board members were brought on to the board in order to be able to hit the female mandate. So I'm a big believer in quality, and I'm a very big believer in a robust search process, because I actually believe that you can get quality as well as hit the diversity goals that a board may have if you look in unexpected places. Um, and you know, going back to the to the earlier comment about does it matter when you have more women in the board I, I, boardroom? I believe that women actually are leading some of those conversations. Uh, remember, it wasn't that long ago that as a woman you were essentially just being invited to join the orchestra. Um, and today we're beginning to focus on becoming conductors of the orchestra, which means we're beginning to have important roles, key roles. Uh, running committees like nominations and governance, like compensation, like audit, where some of these more important conversations about the quality of the board members that you're going to bring in happen, and where you can, in fact, push for the kind of search that will bring excellent candidates that may not have been discovered. Don? I want to go back to something Betsy said around the micro segmenting of diversity and I do worry about that and I, I tend to stay up at night because I worry about the double checking of the box. So people thinking if I can bring in a black woman that's great two checks. And that's not the spirit of what we're trying to do here and advancement for one group shouldn't come at the expense of another so I think as directors as chairs of nominating and governance we have to be really vigilant and careful about that is something I give a lot of thought to and push my boards on. And when you push your boards on that, John, how do they respond? What's the reactions? I think they're they're open to it. I mean, we're always looking for the best candidate. And I and I cringe sometimes when I hear words like it's hard to find qualified candidates, people of color or women, because we know that you just have to look harder, but that they're out there. So the boards recognize that. I think sometimes with the quotas and some of the external pushes, it's easier to kind of try to get multiple, somebody that comes in that can address multiple boxes. But again, I think it's always about bringing in the best candidate. And we do have to be careful again, that you know, we're not looking to have you know, 2019, the year of the woman, 2021, the year of the black person. It has to be about forward advancement for all, for all groups. And I think that's a challenge that we're facing, but I'm confident we'll do it the right way. I think it'll, it just, you have to be thoughtful. Don, you're, you're touching on something I think is really important. If the process is really engaged and transparent and open and you, you know, your the governance committee leads mm -hmm. it, you're actually getting engagement from the rest of the board. Everybody has networks of people. And you know we need to put it through a professional search organization uh, so they can be vetted, their backgrounds, their skills against a thoughtful matrix. But ultimately, I think I'm seeing the best outcomes where you really have a discussion about how you refresh and renew your board over time. Mm -hmm. Just like you outgrow certain management uh, as the company goes on its journey, uh, you outgrow the value of certain of your directors. They've been, you know, earlier in the company's journey or they, you know, their experience was more of a legacy bricks and mortar experience. And now the company is more uh, e-com and digitally centric, you know, or, or the whole, you know, new product cycle has changed to be more acquisition oriented. So you need people who understand post-merger integration, whatever it might be. And when you chart the path of the board, uh, next to the strategy of the company and see what skills you need and talk about it holistically and get everybody involved, I think you get a, a far better outcome and you avoid that box checking, which a lot of boards do get reduced to. And um, I've experienced it. It's, it doesn't get you an optimal outcome at all. You're so right about that, Betsy, that we must never lose sight of the 
purpose of a board, which is to really have that fiduciary responsibility to, uh, you know, to benefit our shareholders and our stakeholders, and to think about risk, uh, which you mentioned in your opening remarks. So if you don't bring people to the boardroom that have the ability to be assessing that in the current state of business, in the current markets, um, you, you really paralyze a company in order to be able to to check some sort of box, which to me is, is wrong. Um, the good news there is that in the search for talent, and, and I, I really emphasize that you know, best athlete and talent should always be um, a very high bar for a board, is that there are roles that move beyond just being a former CEO or CFO or president of a company. There are uh, high demand roles in chief marketing officer, chief digital officer, chief tech officer, mm -hmm. those kinds of areas um, are becoming more and more vital to the long-term survival of businesses. And it gives us a whole new pool of candidates to be looking at. I think that's an excellent point because going to the C-suite, the board too should look at your own C-suite in terms of what are the skills for how this company is developing, right? The strategic direction, that's as you were saying, it changes. So I do have the right skills in those uh, positions. And so is the board in your conversations, Andrea, taking a look at who's in the C-suite or who's one down from the C-suite and maybe they should go on a board because we are finding that our clients are saying does not have to be even a C-suite. I want a functional expert in this whole AI and that may not be quite in the C-suite, right? So are you finding the conversations about your own the boards you're on about your own C-suite and then you know making sure you have the right skills and how much attention is the board paying to bench strength for the CEO with having women and people of color as bench strength so two questions in there sure uh, well absolutely I, I would say the uh, the the pressure to expand the succession planning review has intensified and that includes identifying diverse candidates inside of the organization succession plan, and also looking at candidates that you think are one or two steps away and beginning to help them find roles in the boardroom um, as part of their skill development. So this is, this is particularly important for executives that you see may not be your CEO going forward, but maybe even someone else's CEO. So we are absolutely doing that. And, you know, I am very happy to say that for most of the boards that I serve on, we're, we're probably five deep off of the CEO now in succession review, uh, simply because it's part of the overall diversity review that we do. And we're finding that there are many more women that are in those middle and upper middle management roles. Uh, and many of them are women of color as well that are beginning to become high potential candidates and we wanna keep our eye on them. And so I, I don't know that that's true in every boardroom, but certainly on three of the boards that I serve on, that's where we are today. Dawn, your experience? Yeah, we're, we're, looking, we're looking generally at directors and up, so going deeper than we historically would. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw State Street and others address this point around talent in the C-suite and diversity in the C-suite in their next annual letter, just like they've addressed the board diversity issue in current letters. Um, I know on all my boards, we're pushing CEOs on this topic and we're requesting to have more access to diverse members of the management team to come in and present and talk to the board. And at Hain, for example, the CEO actually invited the female directors to come in and to have a conversation with the high potential woman. I can't even begin to tell you how well received that was. But I also think as we're looking for the pipeline for board directors, a lot of companies still refuse to let people in their company serve on a board if they're not the CEO. So I think that has to change also. It can't be viewed Board service shouldn't be viewed as a distraction from the company. I personally found it to be very additive because it brings you different insights that you can bring back to your own company. So I think that's something that, that at the board level, we can begin to address with our CEOs if we're finding, if there's policies against doing that. Yeah, it's changing, but there are still some that don't allow it. But I do agree, it's very additive. And when they do allow it, women go on to another board and then they mm -hmm. come back 
the CEO says, wow, that was really a great contribution you made in terms of that thought because you learned it from someplace else. Betsy, what are you seeing around the C-suite and you know, developing others below the CEO in the company? Well, I'm seeing a whole shift in the board governance model. You know, I, I think that the old legacy view of what the board did, forensic, look back, how'd we do last quarter, approve the annual plan and, and be more removed has changed. I think we're much more engaged in strategy now on the best boards. And, you know, the board uh, is, you know, as, as both Don and, and Andrea were saying, you know, looking deeper in the organization, understanding the talent pool, uh, seeing what, where are our gaps in, uh, do we have a diverse enough talent pool? Where do we have to have specific programs to increase our onboarding and our funnel of talent? But, but I think that it's the role of the board now to really be more thought partners as well as oversight and fiduciaries on behalf of our investors. You know, it, in the past, it was more single shareholder. Now we have a stakeholder mindset. Uh, you know, environmental, social governance are the pillars that we're we're measuring against. But we're looking at the stakeholders, and that's a much more engaged new governance model. And you know, really, the board's there now as much as oversight, but to be an asset and an accelerant and a, and a provocative. A thought partner with leadership to help them think about what are the next new things we need to be doing because companies don't really go out of business because of you know financial impropriety very often, which was Sarbanes Oxley you know generation twenty years ago. They go away because they're not relevant. They're not competitive. They're not tech enabling. They're not coming up with innovation fast enough. So seeing around the corners and helping to be a, a thought partner on how we keep the business vital, I think is a, a very critical part in this new governance model and bringing up our talent pool in our organizations and into our boards. It's the point of having Gen Zero and millennial engagement. That's half of our population, half of our customers, half of our investors, you know, half of our employees. So I, I think what uh, my colleagues are saying is absolutely right. We want to have that more integrated approach. Hey, Betsy, one thing that has been very helpful um, in, uh, in my personal experience has been the work I've been doing for almost 20 years, or 22 years, I think it is, uh, as a trustee at an HBCU, uh, because we're now being asked to fill the pipeline, okay, fill the pipeline with really highly prepared individuals. And so that kind of long range thinking around how do you tap into the talents of your board? There are many of our board members serve on university, uh, their alma mater boards as well. And that's where you're going to find, uh, you know, the kind of future candidates that will fill your management pipelines that ultimately then earn their way up to the C-suite and earn their way into the boardroom. So, um, so that's, the, that's really taking the long view, is how do you develop talent, okay, from the university level all the way up through the C-suite into the boardroom. Let's talk a little bit about what Betsy just raised, because last year was unprecedented, no playbook. You're all experienced CEOs, board directors. How has that changed in terms of what you were speaking about, corporate governance, really good corporate governance, and this whole uh, webinar is about communications, commitment, and culture. And certainly the culture was really uh, struck hard by the pandemic in terms of employees and engaging them and everybody working virtually. What, was, what were the changes for you as board directors? Because I'm sure the hours you spent were just enormous in terms of strategizing and seeing that company through, and you were on multiple boards during the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about how that changed from what, you know, board directors of maybe three years ago to board directors today, what's being asked of you. And Dawn, let me start with you. It was a big change. And I think the conversation was more around people, which I think is important because if you believe that people are the foundation for the success of the organization, in boardrooms, we historically have not talked about it beyond 
succession planning and an occasional look at and compensation. So really at the board level, we started digging deeper into what is the culture of the company? Can the culture sustain these changes? Is the communication happening appropriately? Is the CEO a good communicator and really being transparent during remote times? And I found that we were much more engaged on those sort of topics around people, talent, consumer safety, of course, um, at a much deeper level than I've seen historically. And I think that's good. And I think it also, um, the women members in the boardroom, I believe really helped drive those conversations forward and they're critical. Etsy. In the beginning of the pandemic, the conversations were the financial security of the company. And then it quickly moved to safety and, and your people. And then how do we function effectively in distributed virtual environments? And I think the, the big question that is still not answered is how are we able to assess our effectiveness and productivity in a distributed environment for our knowledge workers? We know how our factories are doing. Uh, we know how our certain functions are doing, uh, you know, whether it, it, it was, uh, you know, your customer service organization, we sped up automation, but ultimately, that thing that makes the enterprise vibrant and different is the creativity. It's the spark of ingenuity and new ideas. And I think that we haven't been able to do that in a distributed virtual environment as well. You know, Steve Jobs says, you know, he got the great idea, you know, walking down to the water cooler and the serendipity of running into somebody else he wouldn't normally see and it sparked an idea. So I think as we look at as board members, this big question of what's the future of work? When do we return? Do we return 100%? Uh, do we do a hybrid model? Do we stay 100% remote? What works for our industry and our business? I think that's the big challenge. And the lens that we've spent, in my opinion, over-indexed on was uh, the uh, stress of our human capital our anxiety, our, our uh, isolation, uh, no you know, parameters between personal and work life. And we haven't looked at it through the whole holistic pyramid view of, well, what's the best for our enterprise? Because without a vibrant enterprise, you, know, you don't have anything. We've been focused all the popular media on you know, how do the employees feel? And then how, is, how are the teams doing? Are they productive? What unit of work can we assess from the supply chain team? You know, what are our tools for measuring that? Uh, as opposed to only saying, hey, what, how did this impact our people? I think we have to look holistically as we go forward on that. Andrea. Well, certainly this year was for me very uneven is how I would describe the boards. In the, in the cases of organizations that were in essential businesses, it was um, pedal to the metal um, and everything that Dawn described is exactly how that felt. Um, if you were in businesses that were in very forms of lockdown um, and you were dealing with existential issues, which is what Betsy described, which is your financial security and how long can you sustain, uh, you know, essentially being locked out of your business, very different kinds of conversations. So this was a year for uh, that kind of test of a great board, which is what kind of situational leaders do we have in the boardroom? And can each one bring their strengths to bear during this period of time? So if you were in a business that was trying to think about shoring up the balance sheet, you better be certain that you had somebody in that room that fully understood your capital position okay, and your long range planning. Um, if you were a business that was trying to serve consumers and where security and safety was paramount, um, you better have someone in the boardroom that's going to bring up those kinds of human capital issues. So, um, so that's why it brings it full circle, Janice, to the, your original conversation, which is who do you need in the boardroom? Well, you need a diverse group of individuals with a diverse set of skills um, that you can lean into, okay, in both good times and bad to do the right thing for all the stakeholders. And, um, you know, and we saw weaknesses in some of the boardrooms because there were people who literally had nothing to say about point A and nothing to say about point B. 
And so when it comes time to have those secession plans, I hope all of our board members recall those conversations um, and remember who was really contributory to the, to the solutions and the support that, that our management teams needed during this unprecedented time. Truly leadership in the boardroom and in the C-suite, some rose to the top, others didn't. So as board directors, you also had to evaluate your CEO. Was this the right person leading the company and were we headed in the right strategic direction? So the, uh, the, what's in, what the board members are facing today is unlike what they've faced in the past in terms of really good corporate governance. So we're coming to the close of a, a really great discussion. I'd like to go on for another half hour, but parting words for our audience in terms of leadership, um, your role in the boardroom, culture, communications, commitment, what is needed today going forward? I think the most valuable thing going forward is real engagement and real uh, passion and conviction around the opportunity that the company has and finding ways to add value in a very constructive, proactive way without overstepping. Dawn? to accelerate, um, we have to make sure that directorships aren't viewed as a lifetime position or a 10 to 15 year position. I'm not in favor of establishing term or age limits, but I think we have to get comfortable in non-gov and as chair chairpersons and asking people to step down from the board if the needs have changed. And directors need to be more comfortable at stepping down if they feel that they've done their job on the board to make room for more people. Boards like companies need to be living, breathing organizations that adapt to the ever-changing landscape of the challenges we face. So I think it's more comfortable about moving people in and out. Andrea. Yeah, Janice, I would say my, my parting words, words would be, let's not pit ourselves against one another. Um, white women against people of color, men against women. Um, you know, Hispanic against black, that makes no sense. Um, and we should be keeping our, really our eye on the prize, which is to have diverse thought in the boardroom and to ensure that we create equal opportunities for individuals that have the merit to be in the boardroom. And if we do that, we will do the right thing, okay? But let's not pit ourselves against each other. Well, you know, I would add a word to this conversation. That is that you were all courageous board directors. You speak up for what's right, you make sure the communications is going in the right direction, the culture is going in the right direction. There's commitment on the part of the C-suite and the board directors. You are very courageous and I would hope that every board in this country has people like you speaking up for what should be right and good corporate governance will prevail. Thank you so much for joining me today and thank you to the audience as well. And this will be on our website. And if there were any questions, we will send them out to you by email. Betsy, Andrea, Dawn, thank you for joining us today.